What we have today is a liquidity crisis. Liquidity shock. I don't see a liquidity crisis. Liquidity crisis. If you watch financial news long enough, you will probably hear someone either explain a past crash or predict a future one as a liquidity crisis. If you don't know what that means, you found the right video. We're going to explain what a liquidity crisis is, what type of assets are more or less liquid, and what can be done to potentially reduce the risk of a liquidity crisis in the future. So before we can explain a liquidity crisis, it's important to articulate what a liquid and an illiquid asset is. Liquidity is the ability for an asset to be sold quickly because there is an accessible, legible market for that asset at all times. The most liquid asset on earth is always cash. Cash can be traded at almost any time of day, anywhere, for almost anything. The foreign exchange markets where people trade yen for pounds, rupees for rubles, dollars for pesos, are open all hours of the day at some market in some way, shape, or form. You would almost never be worried about being able to translate your dollars or your cash into some other asset. Other examples of highly liquid assets are things like US treasuries, big ETFs and mutual funds that have a broad and deep base of buying desire for them at any point in time. There's lots of people that buy treasuries. There's lots of people that buy the biggest mutual funds and the biggest ETFs on the planet. Even some of the biggest stocks in the world like Google or Apple are deeply liquid equities that you can expect to trade at large volumes at any point in time. On the opposite side, you have assets that are illiquid, like real estate or a private business. Even real estate has varying degrees of liquidity. If you own a residential home in a really nice neighborhood in a city that a lot of people want to move into, you could probably sell that property relatively quickly. There will be some paperwork and underwriting, but relatively quickly if you really wanted to. Conversely, if you have some obscure piece of real estate with a kind of odd shaped house in a weird location, even happens to Michael Jordan in his mansion, it's going to be harder to find a liquid price for that asset if you want to sell it on the open market. To take it to an even greater extreme within the real estate market, think of the biggest and most spectacular commercial buildings out there, the largest skyscrapers. There's a limited quantity of people even capable of buying that asset if they wanted to. And if you wanted to sell it, it would be a tenuous, arduous process to do so. Same thing with a private business. In order to make that asset legible to a potential buyer, whether it be a venture capitalist, a private equity firm, or just some other business owner, you're going to have to give them a ton of detail that they otherwise are not privy to in order for them to make that purchase. So we now understand what it means when an asset is liquid or illiquid. What is a liquidity crisis? When you hear liquidity crisis, you need to think of two things. Number one, the buyers dry up. The liquid pool of buying goes away. The second thing that's happening is forced selling of relatively illiquid assets. So when you think of some of the flash crashes of the past, what happened is the floor of buyers dropped and so did the price. Picture this scenario. We're back in March 2020. And in the light of new headlines around the coronavirus pandemic, COVID, all sorts of uncertainty, fear, doubt, investors are offloading their assets that are obviously bad things to own in the middle of a pandemic. Their cruise lines, their airlines, their hotel companies. And because of the loss that they are taking on those assets, they want to try and balance out their loss by locking in one of their wins. Maybe in the preceding year, a company like Starbucks or McDonald's or Walmart has been a particularly strong performer. And even though they prefer to continue to own one of those blue chip assets, they have to sell in order to balance out one of their losses. Because across the board, investors of all shapes and sizes are coming to a similar conclusion, there's a preponderance of sellers and not very many buyers. So 
names like Starbucks, like McDonald's, that were otherwise seen as very liquid equities to be invested in with a large pool of buyers. When you bought that equity, you presume there were gonna be a lot of buyers when I decide to sell this thing. All of those buyers have vanished. And the prices that you expected to be able to sell for, there's no bids, there's no buyers actually offering that price. The liquidity of that asset has fallen through the floor and so does the price, and so does the entirety of the assets that find themselves sucked into the liquidity crisis. So now it's starting to cascade. That's why they talk about liquidity crises cascading. You've sold your cruise line. Now you're selling Starbucks and Walmart at a loss. And now you're starting to think to yourself, what can I sell that won't trigger some sort of enormous loss? Maybe my losses are mounting. I have to sell another thing to make up for the losses that I've already accrued. So I'm selling off more and more and more of my portfolio. And if everyone finds themselves in that similar cycle with no fresh powder, with no cash, or just no belief that those investments, those assets are worth the price that they're currently being sold for, then you're gonna see this compounding downward spiral as the market searches for liquidity. So this sounds like a bad time. How does it end? Well. The obvious way that it ends is eventually some buyers realize that these prices are too good to pass up and maybe they're like Warren Buffett sitting on all sorts of loads of cash like Scrooge McDuck and they decide to start buying and a floor comes to that price drop. If that doesn't occur or there is a fear that it could drop too far before that begins to occur, outside regulators will intervene. You may remember from March 22 that we saw all sorts of new programs from the Federal Reserve, including the buying of corporate bonds, the buying of treasuries. What they are doing when they institute a program like this is taking the buying opportunity off the table for the safest assets in the world. They're buying the bonds, they're buying the treasuries that people flee to in times of uncertainty because of their huge amounts of liquidity and the relatively robust price levels that they have through these different crises. They come in as buyers at any price for these relatively safe assets. Because of all that buying, the yields, the value of these bonds is their capacity to pay interest back and generate a yield for the buyer. Those yields are so low, so compressed by the fact that there's a buyer out there that doesn't even really care about the yield. That means that the investors who need some form of return are pushed out on the risk curve into the things that are suffering some form of a liquidity crisis. So now the person that wanted to flee and say, I'm not gonna buy Starbucks, I'm gonna go and buy one of these really safe corporate bonds or one of these treasuries, it's like, it's not really worth it for me to buy these super safe assets. I guess I'll come back and be that floor buyer at a relatively higher price, which staves off the drop in those assets during a liquidity crisis. Another solution to this problem is the overall reduction of passive index investing in the markets. The whole key here, as we alluded to in those examples, is that you need discriminant buyers. You need folks that are making decisions off of all sorts of different data points on specific investments that they would make. The majority of passive investors out there are just buying a broad representation of the entire market when they invest in an index fund. They're never making a decision, hey, Starbucks is a little underpriced. Burger King is a little overpriced. They're never making a decision like that, so they cannot possibly be part of the buying pool of liquidity during a crisis. Some estimates suggest that index funds make up as much as 40% of the entire market at this current point in time. So that leaves a relatively smaller set of the total market that's even capable of discriminant price discovery in each individual name. I know this can be a little bit complex. I hope that this video was helpful and a little bit more interesting than some of the kind of canned animated explainer videos that I see on YouTube. If you enjoyed it and you wanna see more video explainers like this on topics surrounding business and finance, let me know in the comments and we'll get to it in 2022.